the dynamics of the narcissist's shared fantasy resemble very much certain types of psychotherapies, certain treatment modalities. In a way, the shared therapy is both a traumatizing experience and a therapeutic one. The narcissist's intimate partners undergo tremendous change, torsion, transformation, and, to some extent, personal growth and development. The narcissist does not mean, of course, to act as a therapist. <laughs> he doesn't mean to apply to you anything like compassion or empathy or understanding or acceptance. He doesn't mean to heal you. He doesn't mean to cure you. He doesn't mean to help you. That's all these are ulterior motives alien to the narcissist. But the shared fantasy is structured in a way that, again, as I said, it replicates very important dynamics in therapy. And the reason the shared fantasy resembles therapy to that extent is because it is founded on the relationship between a child and a mother. You are the mother. The narcissist is the child. And a mother-child experience, a mother-child liaison, a mother-child dyad is at the core of most schools of psychotherapy. The mother-child experience, or at least the parent-child experience, is replicated sometimes intentionally and knowingly in the therapeutic session, in therapy. In therapy, the therapist acts as a parental figure. Therapists like Shando Ferenczi, for example, did it on purpose, acted as a parent on purpose. Others were more reserved. They were not quite sure it's a good idea. <laughs> and a notable example is Sigmund Freud, who has had a very bad relationship with his father. And so, now that we begin to understand the commonalities between the narcissist's interpersonal relationships and the interpersonal relationships which develop in therapy, we can focus and home in on the common denominators. And today I'm going to discuss one of them, and it is regression. And apropos regression, <laughs> my name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and a professor of clinical psychology. Back to the womb. Regression in life, regression in therapy, regression in the shared fantasy. Let's start with some definitions. A regression is a return to a prior, lower state, less developed state of cognitive, emotional or behavioral functioning. It's when you revisit an earlier phase of personal growth and development. It is associated especially with psychoanalytic theory. It's a situation in which the individual reverts to immature behavior or to an earlier stage of psychosexual development. This usually happens when the individual is threatened with stress, anxiety, tension, which are overwhelming, internal conflicts, or sometimes external problems which constitute a crisis, or even worse, a trauma. Many people react to this by self-infantilization. They infantilize themselves. Their, their behavior becomes childish. Their thinking becomes disorganized. Their emotions become dysregulated and black and white, dichotomous thinking, splitting. Regression is not always a bad thing. For example, it is an integral part and a pivot and a pillar of creativity. Creativity involves regression. There is even a name for this, a clinical term. Regression in the service of the ego. Yes, believe it or not. In psychoanalytic theory, regression in the service, at the service of the ego is when the individual circumvents the ego, disables the ego's normal functioning. Remember that the ego has many functions. 
And of course, the ego is a metaphor. No one has captured an ego. No one has spoken to an ego. And no one got married to an ego. Well, in most cases. So, an ego is just a metaphor, an organizational unit, which is essentially abstract and imagined. But it has functions. And one of the main functions of the ego is reality testing. The ego is an interface between our instincts and drives and urges, which could be overwhelming, and reality. The ego is the one who tells us, which tells us, don't do this. The consequences would be dire. That's a seriously bad idea. And what you're doing is wrong. So the ego also includes the superego, a.k.a. conscious. So, in psychoanalytic theory, regression at the service of the ego is when the individual disables or deactivates the ego. Why would anyone do this? Because you want to lose touch with reality. You want to withdraw into fantasy or into imagina your imagination. Creative people do this all the time. When you write a novel, when you shoot a movie, you are detached from reality. You need to be detached from reality if you want to accomplish anything meaningful in art. So these people need to disable the ego. But the minute you disable the ego, you regress. You become an infant. You become a baby. Without your ego, you are two years old or four years old or three years old. Infantilization, regression. You are able to access primitive material, material that harks back and belongs to your early childhood, material that is known in clinical terms as primary processes. And so the creative process has a lot to do with access to the primary primitive experiences, cognitions and emotions of early childhood. And to do this, the individual needs to regress and by regressing, disable the ego. This, was, this process, this mechanism was first described by a Swiss, of course, psychoanalyst, <laughs> Ernst Kris, K-R-I-S. And so Ernst Kris said that, and Ernst Kris, by the way, was a member of the ego psychology school. He says that regression has creative benefits. He felt that the aims of the ego were sometimes enhanced by the ability of people to regress and to use the irrational processes of the unconscious and the id in order to develop alternative ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. He said that innovation, thinking outside the box, creativity, finding solutions to problems, they all require temporary suspension of reality. This is a very interesting approach. Artists do demand flexibility, and this flexibility has wide benefits, much wider than the artistic process alone. So as you see, I just wanted to give an example, that regression is not always bad. When you gain access to primary processes, you can do it only via regression. In psychoanalytic theory, primary processes are unconscious mental activities in which free, uninhibited flows of psychic energy actually infuse one idea after another. And this mental process, this primary process, operates without regard for logic or for reality. It is dominated by the pleasure principle and it provides hallucinatory fulfillment of wishes. Dreams, for example, are primary processes. Fantasies are primary processes. Magical thinking of young children is an example of a primary process. These processes are posited to predominate the id in, in Freud's work. It was also called at the time primary process uh, thinking. Now, I mention fantasy here. Fantasy is a primary process. You're beginning to see why narcissists are actually children. Mentally speaking, emotionally speaking, psychologically speaking, narcissists are children 
because narcissists have only primary processes. Why is that? Because narcissism is 100% a fantasy defense. And fantasy is always a primary process. Why is that? Because fantasy is divorced from reality. The difference between primary processes and the more advanced and elevated secondary or second processes is reality. As you grow older, as you mature, as you transition from childhood to adulthood, you countenance reality, you interact with reality, you learn to evaluate, engage, and appraise reality. You act in reality and on reality. In short, you're embedded in reality. Narcissists never make this transition. They're stuck in fantasy, and their thinking is pre-logical. In psychoanalytic theory, pre-logical thinking is a primitive thought process, very characteristic in early, uh, of early childhood. Thinking, pre-logical thinking, is under the control of the pleasure principle, not the reality principle. And such thinking occurs also later in life, for example, in narcissism, but also in healthy people. When you daydream, for example, when you fantasize deliberately, intentionally, you're actually engaging in pre-logical thinking. Pre-logical thinking usually is intimately connected to what is known as wish fulfillment. But when it goes too far, when it becomes overpowering and the essence of the individual's thinking, it has another name, psychosis. Psychosis is pre-logical thinking that takes over all other types of thinking and represses them. The psychotic has only pre-logical thinking. The same goes as far as a narcissist. But narcissists are able to separate episodic thinking from functional or operational thinking. So a narcissist is able to engage in very high level thinking in his profession, but is unable to engage in logical thinking, advanced thinking in his private life. It's like there are two people. One of them is high functioning and one of them is a child. And put the two of them together and you get a narcissist. Narcissists are therefore focused on fantasy. Narcissists are focused on pleasure, not on reality. Narcissists are hell-bent on wish fulfillment. The gratification in fantasy or in a dream of a wish. And so narcissism incorporates integrally magical thinking, the belief that events or the behavior of others can be influenced by one's thoughts, wishes, or even obsessive compulsive rituals. Magical thinking is typical of children up to age four or five years old and is typical also of narcissists. Narcissists are incapable in private life of reality thinking. They are stuck in magical thinking. There is a concept known as thought-action fusion, TAF. It's the belief that if one thinks about an unpleasant event or a disturbing act, it is more likely to occur. So you hear people saying, don't talk about cancer or it will happen to you. Don't be so negative. Because you are so negative, bad things are happening to you. This is thought-action fusion, this belief, the belief that thinking about an act is morally equivalent to carrying out the act. TAF is often considered to be a feature, particularly of obsessive compulsive disorders, but in reality, it's common to every type of regressive personality. Every type of personality that is stuck in early childhood, that is immature, that is not adult, that is not well developed, that a personality that is not the outcome of linear inexorable growth, this kind of immature personalities, half-baked, not full-fledged, usually have this TAF problem, thought-action fusion problem. 
and it is an integral part of regression. Now, there was a guy, Michael Balint, B-A-L-I-N-T, Balint, a brilliant psychoanalyst, and in the 50s and 60s. By the way, the 50, 50s and 60s were the decade megabilis of psychology, in my view. The object relations schools, especially in the United Kingdom, brought it all together, fused behaviorism, psychoanalysis, and created the first theory of everything in psychology, never to have been surpassed, in my view, with possible exception of Mandua's social learning theory. Okay, enough, Bakhnin, enough with your rants and ruminations. Back to the topic. Bellint was very interested in regression. He suggested that there are two forms of regression, benign and malignant. And this is, of course, borrowed from the study of cancer. Bellint worked for a while, Bellint worked for a while with Vabu, who was a cancer medical doctor and a Nobel Prize winner. Never mind all that. So Balin borrowed terms from oncology, and he said they are malignant and benign regressions. He published a book titled Thrills and Regressions in 1959, and he said that these regressions appear during analysis, during the therapy session, during psychoanalysis. Be, you remember how I started this video when we were all much, much younger and more optimistic? I started this video by saying that the narcissist shared fantasy is a close cousin of certain types of psychotherapies. When you go through the shared fantasy, when you endure it and experience it, the outcomes are sometimes indistinguishable from the outcomes of long-term therapy. And so regression is common in both situations. And when Balin talks about analysis or psychotherapy, just exchange this, replace it with the, with the phrase shared fantasy, and his book is totally valid. Balin said that the benign form of regression is minor, temporary, reversible, but the malignant form of regression is major, serious, lasting, or pervasive, and in many cases, irreversible. Benign forms of regression are beneficial, they are, they are therapeutic, while malignant forms are pathogenic, they create mental illness and can potentially result in insurmountable problems for the patient and the therapist. Again, Balint focused on therapy. We, who know better by now, <laughs> 60 years later, can discuss sh the shared fan fantasy, narcissist shared fantasy, in similar terms. Balint suggested a differential diagnost diagnostic between what he called cluster A and cluster B syndromes. He suggested this in 1968. He said that Cluster A and cluster B syndromes, not personality disorders, syndromes, um, they have constant characteristics. For example, in cluster A syndrome, there's, there's mutual trust between the patient or the client and the therapist. In cluster B syndrome, there is an absence of trust, maybe not active distrust, but definitely mistrust. Um, in cluster A, there are moderate or satiable demands and expectations. In cluster B, the demands and expectations are insatiable. Cluster A um, actually leads to moderate addiction. Cluster A, uh, no addiction, I'm sorry, cluster B leads to addiction. So he said that to avoid the appearance of a malignant form of aggression, I advocate the development of adapted analytic techniques. The discrete, not omnipotent or needlessly intrusive analyst must create a secure permissive atmosphere that the patient needs, as well as the time needed for regression. And he called it a new beginning. He said that this notion is connected to his concept of basic fault, which we're going to discuss in a minute. And so 
Balin described therapy, but when you look at the shared fantasy, you immediately see that it involves malignant regression. Malignant reg regression. It involves addiction. It involves unrealistic expectations and demands. It involves distrust and mistrust, at least on the side of the narcissist, constant paranoid ideation. Ultimately, the intimate partner becomes a persecutory object, an enemy. We are beginning to see the similarities between the two situations. Basic fault is a brilliant concept, first proposed by Balint. It refers to the structural deficiency in the personality of subjects who, during their early stages of development in early childhood, um, formed specific types of object relations. So he said that depending on what happened to you in early childhood, you are likely to develop specific types of object relations. Now, at the same time that Balint was proposing the basic fault, Bowelby and later Ainsworth came up with attachment theory and attachment styles. And there's a lot of similarity between the work of Balint and the work of Bowelby and Ainsworth. Balin said that your early childhood, if it is structurally deficient, impacts your personality, who also, which also becomes structurally deficient. If you are traumatized as a child, if you are abused as a child, if your boundaries are breached, if you are not allowed to separate, if you are parentified, if you are instrumentalized, there are many ways to abuse a child. Yeah? If you are exposed to all this mistreatment and inability to separate and become an individual, if your process of becoming is disrupted, if the integration and constellation of yourself and ego are disrupted, obviously your personality will be structurally deficient and so will your object relations. In other words, your ability to interact with people, your ability to create interpersonal relationships, your ability to even discern the externality and separateness of other people, to accept that they are not you, these abilities will be hampered. Moreover, said Balint, this tendency to have dysfunctional relationships in later life would become compulsive. And this is, of course, Balint was not the first to suggest this. Sigmund Freud was, when he coined the phrase repetition compulsion. Balin said that when you endure a really bad childhood, you have an initial, what he called, lack of adjustment between psychobiological needs and the care provided by a faulty environment devoid of love, acceptance, understanding. So when you have a dead mother, metaphorically speaking, Andre Green's concept of dead mother, when you don't have a good enough mother, to borrow another concept from Donald Winnicott, then you would have severe problems to adjust. You would have an adjustment disorder, as it is called today. The effects of the basic fault, this is the basic fault, this is the primal sin, a childhood that is not appropriate. The effects of the basic fault on a person's character, structure of the personality, psychobiological dispositions, for example, certain mental illnesses. Uh, this basic fault is usually irreversible and in the most optimistic scenario, only partially reversible. We know today, for example, that attachment styles are largely irreversible. I know, I know, don't listen to the nonsense spewed out by self-styled and self-interested so-called experts online. They are bullshitting you because they want your money. The fact is that attachment styles are irreversible. Largely. There are exceptions, of course, but largely. Balin said it as well. He said that the basic fault is irreversible. And he developed this concept 
much uh, in 1957 in a book titled uh, The Doctor, <laughs> The Patient and the Illness. He, Balint had an advantage similar to Winnicott. Winnicott, Donald Winnicott, you may recall, was a pediatrician. Only much, much later in life, he became a psychoanalyst. Most of his work, most of his observations were done as a pedi pediatrician. He had to work with children. He couldn't help it. <laughs> he had to make a living. Similarly, Balint collaborated with physicians. His expertise was neurology and more precisely, psychosomatic medicine, and psychosomatic disorders, conversion symptoms, hypochondriasis, and so on. So he was, one could say, a half doctor, a half medical doctor. In another book, 1958, titled The Three Areas of the Mind, it started off as an essay, Bailin developed the notion of the basic fault zone. He said that therapeutic processes are situated in this basic fault zone. And he said that therapy is impossible within this zone unless you regress certain patients. You have to induce states of regression in certain patients. Bailin was not the first to say this, actually. Shandor Ferenczi was. And Shandor Ferenczi went so far that Freud publicly excoriated him, criticized him, and there was a huge, <laughs> huge fight between him and Ferenczi over this issue, whether regression should be induced in the patient deliberately, intentionally, and intensely, whether the patient should be coerced into a state of regression, which is a bit reminiscent of hypnosis. I have another video which I made a few days ago about hypnosis. Anyhow, Balint reached a conclusion during his work in the 50s, the metapsychological theorization stage. So he reached a conclusion that regression is good, not for all patients, but for many patients. And in a book in 1968, The Basic Fault, Therapeutic Aspects of Regression, he discussed what he called the zones of the psychic apparatus. And in this book, he attacked Sigmund Freud frontally and harshly, I can say. He said there's no such thing as primary narcissism. Um, actually, we need to regress people. And when they regress, they automatically become narcissistic if we apply Freud's work. But it's not narcissism, it's regression. In short, what Bailin suggested is that the concept of narcissism is wrong. It reflects stunted development, it reflects regression, it reflects infantilization, it reflects inability to separate, a wish to go back to the womb, not something that has to do with the management of internal emotional energy. In other words, not something to do with cathexis, but something to do with fixation. I'm not quite sure why he lashed out at Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud said many of these things before, and I don't see why we cannot call this problem narcissism. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> What, um, what kind of provoked Bailin. But Bailin's approach is different to, to Freud's and in many ways closer to Jung, by the way. Jung suggested that narcissism is actually a very healthy process that involves introversion. Introversion is, of course, by definition, a regressive dynamic. It involves regression. Anyhow, Bailin and Jung were closer than Bailin and Freud. And so Bailin said certain patients, patients with schizoid personalities, patients in narcissistic states, patients who are addicts, they're unable to tolerate the frustrations of classical treatment. They're inaccessible to interpretation. You can't talk to them. 
You can't create a, an alliance with them. You can't anything, you know. So he says you need to regress them. You need to modify the technique. If you want to analyze these people, if you want to understand the interpersonal psychic processes, if you want to map map out the basic phone zone, you need to regress them. He said the zone of the human psyche, which, by the way, is very reminiscent of Freud's concept of the ego. But Balin said the zone of the human psyche is more primitive than the area of Oedipal complex or other later developments in life. It's very interesting because both Freud and Balin and many, many other scholars, Ferenczi, I mentioned Ferenczi, there were many others, everyone understood the importance of regression. Everyone understood that if you want to affect a patient, if you want to cure a patient or help a patient cope somehow, you need to regress the patient. You need to make the patient more available for influence, more malleable, less defensive, less rigid, less set in his, in his ways. You need to, when you regress the patient, to an early childhood stage, the patient is much more open, much more open to transformation. Regression is highly therapeutic. And ironically, when the narcissist regresses the intimate partner into the shared fantasy, in the shared fantasy, when the intimate partner becomes the narcissist's child, there is a therapeutic opening there if the intimate partner is available, she could experience growth and development, not because of the narcissist, but because of the exigencies and vicissitudes and difficulties of the shared fantasy. Shared fantasy is a traumatic or traumatizing environment. It's an abusive environment, but an abusive environment that regresses the intimate partner. As a child, the intimate partner has a second chance to cope with abuse, with trauma, with pain, with hurt, with rejection. It's a second chance. The problem is that the narcissist abuses the regression, leverages the regression in order to create in the intimate partner dysfunctional dynamics. For example, dependency or addiction. The narcissist is a malevolent presence, not a therapist. He wants the patient, the intimate partner to regress. He wants the intimate partner to become helpless. He wants the intimate partner to become infantile and childlike or even childish because he wants to gain control over the intimate partner. He wants her to get addicted to him. He wants her to become dependent on him. And then at the same time, he demands from the intimate partner to act as a mother, to become a maternal figure with unconditional love and acceptance. And this conflict, this role conflict, because there are two roles. The narcissist message is, you should be my child. And the second message is, you should be my mother. This creates, of course, enormous tension and conflict and vitiates, negates, the therapeutic aspects of the regression induced by the narcissist. Um, he said that, Balin said that in regression, the regression is a pretty well-defined process. He said, first of all, it has to involve two people. Regression happens in a two-person relationship. Number two, there's a dynamic force there, other than conflict. There's a dynamic force, and that force is an anxiety which drives the patient to perpetuate old models, ancient models, early childhood models of object relations, which now indicate maladjustment, maladaptation. So, on cophilia, clinging to objects or to people, Philo, philo, uh, philobatic attitude attempts self-sufficiency by keeping away from supposedly dangerous objects. 
This dynamic also drives the patient to establish a harmonious relationship with his or her environment at the end. The end of the process is what is known as primary love, harmony, the oceanic feeling, narcissistic elation, if you wish. And finally, Balin said, regression involves the prevalence of nonverbal processes or language use. And this is non-typical of adults. There's a strong indication that the patient is actually a child again. And now just replace the word patient with the word narcissist intimate partner, narcissist best friend, the narcissist counterpart. Replace it. And you see that everything Baylin said applies to the shared fantasy. It is a two-person relationship. It involves uh, anxiety. It generates dysfunctional behaviors like clinging, like addiction, like attempting self-sufficiency, paranoid ideation. And it creates a fantasy of harmony and love. And in, within the shared fantasy, there are many nonverbal, infantile, primitive processes and defenses that are activated. Balint himself used the term psychological mothering. He said that regression involves a kind of psychological mothering, which makes it possible to avoid reproducing the traumatic situation. Object relations, rather than interpretation, provide the therapeutic leverage. But this is exactly what the narcissist makes sure doesn't happen in the shared fantasy. The narcissist not only seeks to not only seeks to avoid the traumatic situation, he inflicts it. It's not that the narcissist regresses the intimate partner in order to avoid early childhood traumas or adult trauma. On the very contrary, the narcissist regresses the partner so that he has absolute power over her and the capacity to traumatize her, including trauma bonding. So the narcissist seeks to traumatize. And the object relations within the shared fantasy are maladjusted, are maladaptive. The object relations are dysfunctional. Regression, said Balint, is also a function of the responses of the therapist. And of course, in the shared fantasy, regression is a function of the responses of the narcissist. It is the other party the therapist, the narcissist, they decide if the regression is benign, aimed at producing recognition of previously unacknowledged needs, even if they're not satisfied, um, soothing some forms of satisfaction, maybe libidinal contact, maybe physical, or if on, if, if the regression is malignant, terrifying, insatiable. So, the belief in Balin's work is that in therapy it's possible to re-establish the primary love relationship, the relationship with the mother that has been disrupted, to somehow um, try to fix the basic fault. Balin said that for some patients this is possible, many others it's not. He actually hinted that you could never really heal the basic fault. You could never really change it. It's pretty irreversible. He hinted at this. It was not bon ton, it was not politically correct at the time to say this. But for example, throughout his text, throughout his books, Balint refuses to use the words heal or cure. He says neutralize. We can neutralize the basic fault. In other words, the basic fault is going to remain there. The primary archaic wound, the disrupted insecure attachment style, they're going to remain forever for the lifespan. Nothing we can do about it, but we can somehow neutralize it. We can somehow teach the patient to let go of compulsive object relations to break the chain of repetition compulsion. Now, Balin's work has dealt mostly with schizoid 
in, in narcissistic patients. At the time, this was the hot button topic. Guntrip did the same. He also worked, you know, his main work was, was schizoid, same, Seinfeld, the same. Everyone was focused on schizoid. Schizoid empty core, schizoid states, and so on and so forth. And today we know that when they were using the word schizoid, in many cases, they actually meant narcissist. Similarly, Harvey Cleckley, in his book, Masterpiece, The Mask of Sanity, uses the word psychopath when actually he means to say narcissist. So, Balin focused on schizoids, schizoids and people with not, what he called narcissistic states, because he refused to accept primary narcissism, and so on. He called it narcissistic states. Anyhow, the irony is that Balin's work is actually much better suited for borderlines. Because borderlines have some of the equipment left. Narcissists have nothing. Narcissists have no self. Narcissists have no ego. Narcissists have no positive emotions. Narcissists have no empathy. Nothing to work with. Well, the borderline has a modicum of empathy, positive emotions, very strong, dysregulating, overwhelming positive emotions. She has a self. She also has a false self, but she does have a rudimentary kind of diffused self. She has an identity, however disturbed. She has, in the borderline patient, there, there are elements you can work with as a therapist, not so in, in narcissism. So Balin's work applies to borderlines much more than it does to narcissism. The early distortion in the ego should also take into account the pathogenic processes stemming from the patient's family, cultural context, society, period in history, life circumstances, environment, others, other people, and so on and so forth. Balin's mistake was to focus on the internal processes only and to neglect, ironically, because he was in the object relations school, to neglect to a large extent everything outside the patient as if the patient was some kind of abstract entity, not embedded in any context. But today, Balin's work has been expanded and focus on the nonverbal today, we realize, should not allow the underestimation of the crucial role of everything else. And that includes language and signifiers. Um, the ego is actually everything. The ego is an organizing principle of the world, of your, you in the world, the self. So the ego is a kind of internal object or introject because it includes a self representation, other representation, and world representation. And this is the insight that was yielded by um, Balin's work. I would like to read to you a great summary and encapsulation of regression, the concept of regression. It was published in an article uh, titled Regression, Diagnosis, Evaluation and Management, Primary Care Companion, was authored by Loco Stern, Loco, <laughs> appropriately, but it's L-O-K-K-O, Stern and others. You can find a link in the literature. Here's a segment from this article. What is regression? According to Sigmund Freud, say the authors, regression is an unconscious defense mechanism which causes the temporary or long-term reversion of the ego to an earlier stage of development instead of handling unacceptable impulses in a more adult manner. Regression is typical in normal childhood and it can be caused by stress, by frustration or by a traumatic event. Children usually manifest regressive behavior to communicate their distress. Addressing the underlying unmet need in the child usually corrects the regressive behavior. Regression in adults can arise at any age. It entails retreating to an earlier developmental stage, emotionally, socially, or behaviorally. Insecurity, fear, and anger can cause an adult to regress. In essence, individuals revert to a point in their development when they felt safer 
and when stress was non-existent, or when an all-powerful parent or another adult would have rescued them. Regressive behavior can be simple or complex, harmful or harmless to the individual, showing the behavior and to those around them. Regression becomes problematic, especially, for example, in a hospital, when it is employed to avoid difficult adult situations or stressors. Managing regression is resource intensive and can prolong uh, treatment. Regression has been portrayed in a more positive light by others, psychologists like Carl Jung, who have argued that an individual's regressive tendency is not just a relapse into infantilism, but an attempt to achieve something important, for example, a universal feeling of childhood innocence, a sense of security, reciprocated love and trust, and so on. What are the manifestations of aggression? I'm continuing to read from the article. Many psychoanalysts have observed that behaviors associated with, with regression are correlated with the psychological stage at which the person is fixated. For example, an individual fixated at the oral stage might suck on a pen, eat impulsively, vomit, or become verbally aggressive, while an individual fixated at the anal stage might be messy or untidy, and an individual fixated at the phallic stage would revert to physical symptoms or to a state of conversion hysteria. Sometimes a regressed pa patient might stop talking and give all the signs that a distressed baby would show during a preverbal stage. In adults, regressive behavior is manifest in myriad ways. Here are some common regressive behaviors. For example, engaging in quiet baby talk, being incontinent, crying, sucking on objects or body parts, masturbating, verbally abusing stuff, whining, being mute, needing a comfort object like a stuffed animal, playing possum or dumb, being physically aggressive, hitting, scratching, biting, kicking, assuming the fetal position, rocking, pacing, having temper tantrums, bedwetting. Many children, example given when they are tired, hungry or afraid, have temper tantrums, expressions of strong emotions, on a daily basis until they are three or four years old. In fact, preschoolers with a DSM diagnosis, such as depression, displayed significantly more violence during tantrums with a difficult recovery compared to healthy preschoolers. Moreover, temper tantrums are a frequent reason for referral to behavior therapists and are among the most common behavior problems of childhood. Some of the behaviors associated with childhood tantrums include shouting, screaming, crying, falling to the floor, flailing their extremities, hitting, kicking, throwing items, and having breath holding spells. Tantrums may also start with shouting and angry outbursts, followed by sobbing, withdrawing, and seeking comfort. Adults with temper tantrums have them for the same reasons as children. They are distressed. Being, being in a distressful situation, being in a stressful situation, um, can fuel tantrums. Adults with temper tantrums exhibit some or all of the behaviors exhibited by children. Unfortunately, temper tantrums can be disruptive and pose problems for other people. Engaging in quiet baby, baby talk, also referred to as infant-directed speech, can be a manif manifestation of regression in adults. Compared to adult-directed talk, baby talk has higher mean fundamental frequency, a wider range, and a more musical rhythm. While some scholars consider baby talk as a universal and species-specific adaptation, others find it to be more prevalent in certain cultures. Baby talk is often employed by adults when communicating with babies and infants, and it can serve various functions, including communication of affective intentions, essential in the emotional bonding between adults and babies. When it is not a show of regressive behavior, adults can also employ baby talk when characterizing victims as weak or cowards, for example, when they during bullying. Adults who need assistance with grooming or feeding 
may also be considered as regressed. Among hospitalized patients, for example, being incontinent bedwetting can also be a manifestation of regression. An inability to perform basic activities of self-care is often highlighted during periods of stress, even if the underlying disability is caused by a medical or psychological illness. While some acutely distressed individuals, for example, people in pain, can assume a fetal position and cry in response to their suffering, physical or emotional, other people prefer to cuddle with a stuffed animal, a teddy bear. It is important to note that crying, crying can communicate distress caused by a variety of challenging situations, including loss, pain, anxiety or fear, or in response to positive emotions, such as joy and the news of a good prognosis. Now, I mentioned Freud um, and I mentioned others, and I would like to give you an overview of the scholars that have dealt with, with uh, regression. So, in psychoanalytic theory, regression is a defense mechanism. It's when the ego reverts to an earlier stage of psychosexual development because of some overwhelming external problems, some internal conflict, and so on and so forth. In 1900, Sigmund Freud described regression in the context of dreams and the interpretation of dreams. In 1905, he incorporated the, the, the concept of regression in his discussion of sexual perversions. But the first time he really dealt with it, as it is, was in a paper titled The Disposition to Obsessional Neurosis in 1913. In 1914, he modified the text of the book Interpretation of Dreams, and he distinguished between three types of regression. He called it topographical regression, temporal regression, and formal regression. All in all, Freud regarded regression as a type of inhibited development, a fixation. Um, it's a formative element in the creation of what at the time was called neurosis. If Freud said that and I'm quoting, the libidinal function goes through a lengthy development. He said that a development of this kind involves two dangers, first of inhibition and secondly of regression. So he regarded regression as all negative thing. It's a bad thing. He said that inhibitions produce fixations. And I'm quoting, the stronger the fixations on its path of development, the more readily will the function evade external difficulties by regressing to the fixation. Freud regarded neurosis as the product of an escape from a reality that is intolerable, burdensome, unbearable. So when someone confronts reality and can't cope with it, he becomes neurotic. He said that along the path of involution, of regression, or a return to earlier phases of sexual life, phases from which at one time satisfaction was not withheld, that's how we cope with unsatisfactory reality. This regression appears to be a twofold one, a temporal one, insofar as the libido, the erotic needs, hark back, go back to stages of development that are earlier in time, and formal one in that the original and primitive methods of psychic expression are employed in manifesting these needs. And so he said that regression has a behavioral dimension and it, the behavior crucially depends on what stage of fixation, what stage of psychosexual development the regression occurs, takes you back to. What is the des destination of the regression? It's like a train going backward. Which station does it stop at? And so he, this oral stage, anal stage and so on, I will not go uh, into it into all of this. You remember Chris, the Swiss American uh, psychoanalyst who came up with the idea of uh, regression at the service or in the service of the ego. And he said that regression in the service of the ego, the specific means whereby preconscious and unconscious material appear in the creator's consciousness. And so he had a much more positive view, of course. Carl Jung argued earlier, prior to Chris, that, and I'm quoting, the patient's regressive tendency is not just a relapse into infantilism, 
but an attempt to get at something necessary, the universal feeling of childhood innocence, the sense of security, of protection, of reciprocated love, of trust. So he, Jung regarded regression as a positive thing in effect, potentially positive. It could lead you to an earlier stage of development where you felt safe, where there's been a secure base, the oceanic feeling, a, a, a sensation of unity and harmony. But Chris, in the wake of Jung, wanted to make an important distinction. He said that inspiration, in which the ego controls the primary process and puts it at the service of the ego, needs to be contrasted with the opposite condition in which the ego is overwhelmed by the primary process. Um, Chris's approach is problematic in many ways because, for example, it's not quite clear how the ego gains control over the primary process <laughs> if it is sidelined by the regression. We regress sometimes into pre-ego states unless you accept the work of Fairburn and others, Klein, Melanie Klein, who say that we're born with an ego. But otherwise, we regress to a pre-verbal or non-verbal stage prior to the ego, and so it's not quite clear how the ego makes use of this. But um, Chris regarded regression as the essence of art, the crux, the gist of being an artist. An artist is someone capable of regression at will. Someone who regresses beyond or around the ego, accesses primordial atavistic early archaeological layers of childhood and from this access, unmitigated access to primary processes, primitive layers, early childhood memories and experiences, creativity erupts. Uh, Eisenk suggested that creat creativity is somehow connected to psychoticism and we did see that the primary process taken to extreme is actually psychosis. So we there are, we see the links here. Uh, Chris said that uh, the creative process is only in the fiery storm of a profound regression, in the course of which the personality undergoes both dissolution of structure and reorganization. That the genius becomes capable of wrestling himself from the traditional pattern that he had been forced to integrate through the identifications necessitated and enforced by the Oedipal constellation, and I may add, socialization. Here we begin to see a similarity, superficial similarity, between Dambowski's concept of positive disintegration and Chris's concept of regression to the service of the ego. But the similarity is superficial and wrong. These are not the same things. While in Chris's concept, regression is a totally positive process, utterly controlled by the ego somehow, in, inexplicably by the ego, but utterly controlled, and leads to outcomes such as creativity and so on and so forth. In Dombrowski work, Dombrowski's work, positive disintegration is triggered by a crisis, is triggered by negative externalities, events, um, failure, defeat, humiliation, shame, rejection. It's, it's triggered by negativity and it is a process of disintegration. And the outcome of the disintegration is not necessarily reorganization, but change. So whereas Dombrowski's approach is post-crisis, the disintegration brought on by a crisis which could lead to positive outcomes via personal growth, development and transformation. In Chris's work, the process is positive from A to Z, has nothing to do with personal growth and development, it has to do with creativity, and does not involve necessarily a crisis or a trauma or whatever. Uh, in the 1960s, Chris's work was so influential that regression became um, 
a positive good. Everyone was talking about regression. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I'll read to you an excerpt. In this particular type of journey, the direction we have to take is back and in. They will say that we are regressed and withdrawn and out of contact with them. True enough, we have a long, long way back to back to, uh, to contact with reality. And so there was a glamorization or glorification of regression. Um, Jungians were a bit more reserved. They said that romantic regression meant a surrender to the non-rational side which had to be paid for by a sacrifice of the rational and individual side. Freud, of course, was totally against. He said this extraordinary plasticity of mental developments is not unrestricted in direction. It may be described as a special capacity for involution, regression, since it may well happen that a later and higher level of development, once abandoned, cannot be reached again. He warned, in other words, that regression could be irreversible and have a horrible after effects. Anna Freud, his daughter, regarded regression as the number one defense mechanism, the most important one. She suggested that people act out behaviors from the stage of psychosexual development in which they are fixated. So she believed that all people are fixated she believed that fixation was a universal phenomenon, in effect. And therefore, regression was inevitable as a defense mechanism, totally automatic, similar to, let's say, rationalization. Bailint, we mentioned, distinguished between nasty, malignant regression and benign regression. We discussed it at, uh, at length. And there were others. And they highlighted the dilemmas of dealing with regression. How to control it? How to induce it? Should we induce it? What to do when it is induced or triggered or provoked and so on and so forth? They warned against making premature assumptions about the patient's state of regression in the therapy. Uh, they, they said that regression might block awareness of more adult functioning. So as the 60s progressed, there was a backlash and people began to be wary of regression. They were beginning to be afraid of regression. Um, some, some scholars said that regression is justifying a retreat from regressive material. Um, and it has disturbing aspects and so on and so forth. There was a psychoanalyst, Peter Bloss, BLOS, he suggested that revisiting of early psycho psychic positions helps the adolescent come out of the family envelope. Regression during adolescence advances the course of development. Stanley Olinick, O-L-I-N-I-C-K, Olinick, he spoke of regression in the service of the other. Um, ego regression is a precondition for empathy, he said. So he said that demonstrating pain, impairment, is also a form of regression. When regression becomes the cornerstone of a personality and the life strategy for overcoming problems, it leads to an infantile personality. But otherwise, it could be leveraged positively in personal development and in therapy. The debate, as you see, is still ongoing. But we should not confuse um, the shared fantasy with therapy in this sense. Even if the dynamics are pretty similar, the intentions of the narcissist, unconscious as they may be, the motivations of the narcissist, hidden from, from himself as they may be, the narcissist self-deceives, but still, this is not a good setting. The shared fantasy is a malevolent, malicious theater of the absurd, where the intimate partner is driven to regress so that it can fulfill a role in the reenactment of the narcissist's early childhood. In other words, the intimate partner is instrumentalized 
parentified, abused yet again, all over again. This is not therapy. Yes, the intimate partner is regressed. The narcissist is regressed as well. In order for the intimate partner to become the narcissist's mother, he needs to regress. Regression is a key feature, critical feature of the shared fantasy. But there are therefore three types. There is positive regression, which leads to growth and so on and so forth. There's negative regression, which leads to an infantile state and is largely irreversible. And there is a regre instrumentalized regression, which is used in order to foster addiction and dependency and to assert control over another person. And that is the type of regression used profusely in um, the shared fantasy. As to concepts like post-traumatic growth and um, positive disintegration, they do involve to some extent regression, but they have nothing to do with regression as a goal in itself. Because they emanate from a traumatic background or context or a life crisis or failure or defeat, they emanate from negativity. They are much closer, ironically, to the shared fantasy than to regression at the service of the self, which is about creativity or benign uh, regression or even malignant regression in Bailey's work. The intimate partner is disintegrated in the shared fantasy. It's taken apart, it's broken. The damage is huge. But it is true that the intimate partner gains the potential and the possibility and the opportunity for positive reintegration. So, positive disintegration does not exist in the shared fantasy. It's negative disintegration, but it could lead to positive reintegration in the healing aftermath, after narcissistic abuse. And during this healing phase, after narcissistic abuse, the regression induced in the intimate partner by the narcissist can be leveraged therapeutically in order to create separation individuation and to say a final goodbye to the narcissist. Let me explain this, because this is a very crucial insight and a therapeutic technique. The narcissist regresses the intimate partner. So now she's a child, an infant. And the narcissist does horrible things to this infant, abuses the infant cruelly, sadistically, tortures, torments the infant. It's horrible. But then it's over. The relationship is over. The narcissist has discarded this this infant, this intimate partner. Now the intimate partner, in her state as an infant, in her regressed state, she has the possibility to reintegrate herself, to reconstitute herself, and to experience separation individuation, separate from the narcissist in her mind, the introject of the narcissist, and it become again an individual. Separation individuation is possible only subject to regression, only in the wake of regression. Ironically, by regressing the intimate partner, the narcissist provides her with the capacity to separate from him and to become an, the individual that she used to be, to reconstitute herself, to rebuild herself. It is the regression in the shared fantasy that makes it possible after the shared fantasy is long over.